Good evening everybody and um, welcome to this webinar which um, is with the MHPN and the General Practice Mental Health Standards Collaboration and tonight we're looking at tips and strategies to enhance communication between medical and mental health professionals. Currently we have over 600 people logged in and we had 2,500 registrations for this so it's clearly a topic that people are really interested in. Um, We'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We pay respects to the elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the cultures and the hope of Indigenous Australia. My name's Mary Emilius. I'm a doctor based in far north Queensland where it's been raining heavily all day. We have um, panel members from Melbourne and South Australia as well who I'll introduce shortly and participants from all over the country. Um, I've facilitated a number of MHPN webinars before and my background is in general practice and psychotherapy but now I'm working as a psychiatry registrar. So I've had, a, I worked at a headspace, two different headspaces for a long time and the, the topic of collaboration is really um, important to me personally as well. This, uh, the, the General Practice Mental Health Standards Collaboration have commissioned the MHPN to plan, produce and deliver this webinar, which is focusing on communication between medical and mental health professionals. To learn more about um, this topic, you're encouraged to read the GPMHSC's practice guide, which is about communication between men medical and mental health professionals. It's available in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. There's a little folder icon. That's the resources tab. It's also available on the GPMHSC website. And in a moment I might ask Morton to just tell us a tiny bit more about the GPMHSC because I've just realised many of the allied health um, participants probably won't know much about that. Now um, you've been introduced to the panellists before tonight through the webinar invitation but I'd like to introduce um, each person individually tonight. So I think first of all, I might start with Samantha. Now, Samantha, you're in uh, Victoria. Yes. And I noticed on your bio that you have established um, a practice called SAM. And I wondered if yes. you could tell us a little bit about that and what SAM stands for. You're about the first person that's actually asked that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume it stands for something. Yeah, I like I like that. Um, well, obviously it's an acronym for my name, but my business uh, sort of covers a wide area from general mental health to sort of performance psychology because I trained in both. So the acronym start, stands for S is for seek, and then A is for arrive, and M is for maximise. So it can indicate seeking treatment, arriving, actually getting there and achieving what you want or really flying to the next level. Thanks, Thanks Nova. It's, it's great to have you on the panel. Um, and I, and from, from your, your background, we can see that you've had a, a lot of experience with interdisciplinary collaboration in mental health. Yes. So it's going to be great. Um, now, Heather, I'd like to invite you. I'd just like to introduce you. So. Um, you are n not only a, a peer worker, but you also teach peer workers. And it sounds like you've been involved with, with that area of um, mental health support work for a really long time. Could, is, um, um, yeah, just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, obviously I've got a lived experience myself um, and was a bit inspired by Sherry Mead, who's a great um, peer worker. And Eventually, um, I was the first peer worker in the southeast of South Australia and then moved to Adelaide. And now I'm actually um, lecturing in the Certificate for in Mental Health Peer Work and mentoring some um, peer workers and supervisors. Welcome. And it's, it's uh, probably one of the newer sort of professions that we need to learn more about how to collaborate with is mental health peer workers because not, not every organisation is... Um, employing peer workers yet, but it, it does seem to be the direction that things are going. And it's, in my experience, it's really, really helpful. So it's great to have you on the panel. Thank you. Uh, and Morton. So Morton, you're a GP in Melbourne 
and you have That's lots correct. of other experience as well on the bio, also very involved in um, interdisciplinary collaboration. I just wondered if you could just tell the audience a little tiny bit about the GPMHSC of which you are the chair, I understand, because I don't know that our allied health professionals will know what the GPMHSC is. Sure. Thanks, Mary, and uh, thanks to everybody for joining this webinar tonight. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm the chair of the GPMHSC. Uh, the GPMHSC has been around for oh, about uh, 14, 15 years now, but it's in the last uh, 10 years has been charged by the federal government with developing the standards for the general practitioners in order to undertake uh, training uh, for the use of the better access in mental health uh, item numbers uh, through Medicare um, and we also provide the training uh, standards for those GPs who are doing focused psychological uh, support uh, item numbers uh, through Medicare. So we're all about education and training and the standards required for GPs to meet uh, in order to access Medicare in this vital area. Great, and I, I guess that historically the Mental Health Professionals Network and the GPMHSC came about roughly the same time in relation to the better access um, item numbers in Medicare. MHPN was maybe a little bit later. It was a little bit later, um, yeah. GPMHSC has been around uh, a bit longer uh, and some of the People on the GPMHSC had the ideas around the MHPN to try and facilitate uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, communication, harmony, and working better for our patients. Great. Well, I think this, the the numbers for this webinar indicate how um, how important this topic is, and I guess that's why both these organisations exist, really. So I just want to bring, bring us back to just a few ground rules. So to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to gain the most from the live webinar, we ask that everybody remembers the following ground rules. Please be respectful of other participants and panellists and just behave as though you would in a face-to-face -face activity. There are going to be many people who watch the webinar um, retrospectively in the MHPN webinar library. For those who are live, the chat box is just as though you were um, sitting in a room with other people. Um, now, you may also interact with each other by using the participant chat box. Please note that if you post your technical issues in the participant chat box, you might not be responded to. So if you have any technical issues, you need to put them in the technical help box, uh, which is just there. So there's a phone number that you can ring. Um, there's also technical support, frequently asked questions there. Now, just to bring us back now to the vignette, just to notice that um, the vignettes refer to psychologists um, and GPs, but there's not, not vignettes that actually include um, specific mention of professions like social work and occupational therapy. It's not a deliberate, deliberate oversight, uh, mental health nursing as well. It's, it's just the way that the um, the cases were written. So we, we could substitute other disciplines for those, recognising that under better access, um, lots of disciplines provide uh, focused psychological strategies and the mental health nurses are under the Mental Health Nurse Incentive Program. So through a facilitated panel discussion about these cases, uh, we're going to describe key principles for effective communication between medical and mental health professionals, identify challenges and obstacles to communication, um, and improve patient outcomes by implementing tips and strategies to enhance communication and reduce challenges. So really this is about communicating better so that we can help our patients um, get better outcomes. Now, just to let you know, there's a couple of changes. If any of you have been on MHPN webinars before, this is a slightly new um, upgraded platform. So because this series has become so popular, we've We've made improvements to the platform. So it has a slightly different look 
So just a guide for the audience. To access the chat box, there's a spot down the bottom where you can click open chat and the chat box will open in a separate tab. Um, the resources are down in the little folder icon in the bottom corner and you know about the technical support issue. Um, at the end, we would like you to participate in our exit survey, which does inform MHPN's um, future webinar plans. So uh, please participate in that. The, the feedback's taken really seriously. Um, now the other thing is that tonight's format is going to be a bit different because we have a series of vignettes rather than one case study or so, so it'll be a little different to what you're used to. So you've all read the vignettes or you've been distributed them prior and they're also down in the resources tab if you need a refresher. So we're going to spend most of the time with the panel unpacking the hypothetical scenarios, um, having a bit of fun with them hopefully. Uh, and the aim of this is to generate tips and suggestions and ideas and strategies. So it'll perhaps be a little bit more informal, but we're really confident that you're going to get lots of useful things um, out, out of the conversation. We will have an audience poll, which will help us guide the conversation. Um, and then each of the presenters has made an individual presentation, um, which is available to you in the slides, in the resources box. We may or may not uh, formally go through those depending on how the discussion goes. So um, the um, expert contribution of each of, each of the panellists is available in their slides, but we may not necessarily formally cover that. Um, now just before we go on to our first um, vignette, I'm going to take, um, we're coming back to that in a second, I'm just going to take uh, an executive decision because I am the one in the facilitator's chair. I wanted this slide to be in here because I think some professions are very comfortable and familiar with shared decision making and others it's, it's not um, necessarily traditionally how they've operated. So I just wanted to articulate that this is really a foundation of, of good practice in mental health and there's lots of research to show that shared decision making contributes to to better outcomes. So at a minimum, both the clinician and the patient are involved in the treatment decision making process and actually often there may be other people like family and carers or more than one clinician. The clinician and the patient share information with each other so it's a two way street. Both the clinician and the patient take steps to participate in the decision making by expressing their treatment preferences and then a decision is made together to um, agree on the treatment plan that's going to be implemented. So it's a decision that everybody can live with rather than one person dictating what will happen. Um, so just to keep that in mind that that's probably what we're aiming for. Now I'm going to bring us back to the panel and we're going to start with talking about Karen. So I might just read a couple of little bits about this because what I liked about all of the vignettes that they were really quite real. So um, let's say you're the allied health clinician in a busy clinic and you've got a better access referral for a young first time mother, Karen. And um, she is keen to come, but she's got a young baby and it's quite hard for her to come. She's frequently changed the appointment, but at the same time she's saying it's really urgent. And as the allied health clinician, you've been ringing the GP and trying to find out a little bit more and you're worried about perhaps this is urgent or it has an element of risk but you're just frustrated because you can't get through to the GP. So I think I might start first of all by asking you, Samantha, as the psychologist, um, whether this kind of scenario is, is familiar to you or, or other allied health clinicians that you know. Absolutely. This one, this one actually scared me see, to, go, to go off first because I was thinking there's so many different ways I could look at this one. Um, and. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure which one would be the best way, but it's, yeah, it would be very common. And likewise, I'd say even at my practice, my practice manager probably does the same thing at my end to protect me. Um, and, and I think that... Um, have you found any anything that, that works to try and get through to the GP? We're going to ask the GP in a minute, but what's worked from yeah. your end? Well, the two things, I'm, um, I think what I try and do first is 
I try to butter up the practice manager first. So I will make it very clear that I'm not trying to interrupt their session with a patient and that I wouldn't appreciate the same, um, but that it's pretty urgent for me to, to get hold of this person because I'm trying to take this referral. Um, and I, I really do try and get them to give me an indication of the best time that that GP is available, so even if it's a lunch hour. Um, with sometimes if they keep blocking it, I have actually offered my mobile after hours um, so that I can get that GP to at least um, give me something so I can get back to the client. Um, I've also sent letters that at least say I've got the referral the referral sitting here, but I can't take it because I need a bit more history and I need to talk to you first. So a letter might be not um, screened as much as an email or something else maybe. So um, I've tried that. If they, all of that doesn't work, I get my top dog practice manager who butters up people really nicely to speak to the other practice manager. And what she will normally do is try and arrange between our diaries a, a five, 10 minute phone consult um, that in our diaries um, that we both know we're available for. Um, and the final option I go to is probably, I, I ask my client, when are you seeing the GP next? Um, if, it, if they're going to review with them soon or vice versa, I might ring with the consent of the client when I'm, you know, if I took that client in for the first session and try and get the GP, because normally the practice manager would, would be okay with that situation. So it was sort of a scenario and I really don't know whether I've hit the right spot. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Actually, um, Heather, I'm gonna just bring you in. So just thinking about it for a person in Karen's position, some of the questions that came in from the, um, the registrants for the webinar, there are some questions about sometimes that um, patient confidentiality can be a perceived uh, barrier. So I wonder whether as the client, how you feel about the psychologist or the social worker, allied health clinician contacting the GP to get a bit more information. Is, is that something that you feel um, clients would be comfortable with? Um, this, this really resonated with me because I was actually in this situation of being a, a young mum and um, knowing that I needed to go and get help and having been referred to help but not being able to get there. Um, for all sorts of reasons for the new for the new bulk. Um, I'm just wondering, um, is there anything that would stop the psychologist actually contacting the, the person? So the, the psychologist is actually contacting the client contacting and saying, look, is there anything to do? Right. Just to see whether or not there's um, some sort of obstacles that are preventing her from actually coming and making her feel welcome to bring the baby or bring a support person to look after the baby while she chats to the psychologist. Sure. I, I guess, um, well, I might just ask Sam and, and then we'll go to Morton as the GP, but Sam, is there, for some, I guess different professions and different clinicians may have different views about it, but what, what yeah. would be the kinds of reasons that might make you a bit reluctant to contact the client directly till you'd got more information. I guess if we were going off this scenario, um, you know, the, the, the psychologist seems a little concerned about taking the referral before they're speaking to the GP. Um, so I guess if you engage with the client before, before that and the person's fairly urgent, um, you might be inclined to see that client or almost start some of the assessment over the phone. Um, and then that makes it a lot harder to sort of put them off. Um, so in that case, that would be hard, but I certainly have, I have in cases where it's been hard to do that, um, at least um, tried to sort out that whether it's a, a, a child minding situation and, and encourage them to bring the baby because I work with children and adolescents, so that's okay for my practice and my staff are okay with that. So I would certainly, um, try and do that if there wasn't the concern. If it hadn't been written, yet yeah, they really wanted to speak to the GP before accepting the referral. Um, yeah. I, I so. guess sometimes um, something might turn out to be much much more complicated than is appropriate for better access or might be needing actually a, a tertiary referral service or something. And I guess some practitioners would be a bit cautious about 
um, establishing a therapeutic alliance with someone that maybe yeah. they then couldn't continue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Morton, I'd like to invite you in. So let's imagine oh. that you are the GP. Um, is your practice manager keeping people away who need to talk to you? And how, you know, how how do you cope with that, or how how do you? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good question. And look, most. Uh, receptionists tend to be fairly protective of uh, their clinicians, whether that be psychologists, GPs, uh, anybody who has a front desk um, uh, has a degree of defence. Um, I guess one of the issues is that uh, it's about having that conversation with the front staff as to when it is appropriate to interrupt um, and also when is it appropriate to organise um, uh, appearance uh, or discussion time with other practitioners because of course GPs are going to be being contacted by you know, the local cardiologist or the uh, local police or you know we, we get calls from all sorts of people every day um, as well as our patients inquiring about urgent test results or things that they're particularly worried about um, and we all do have systems in our practices to uh, to deal with that um, they can often be improved um, but it, it, it is about having a process around that um, and certainly for me personally in my practice my reception staff know that if somebody says it is urgent about a particular patient um, they will ask the person who's ringing them do you really need to speak to Dr. Rowland right now? Um, or can he ring you back and he's got time at X? Um, and that's usually during my lunch break um, or when I'm driving between meetings or something like that or after hours. And um, unfortunately, many GPs do work long hours um, and many do work shifts. Uh, as many allied health professionals do too. Um, so sometimes I won't be getting back to people until 6.30, 7.30 at night, some, sometimes. Um, so but so more always, in, in, well, in that case, it would be quite helpful to have the allied health clinician's um, mobile number and, and to know right. whether you could call back after hours. Yeah, and look, I, I also say, you know, if this needs to be, you can send me an email or things like that. Uh, good old fashioned fax machines uh, still exist in general practice very much. And we can certainly uh, um, accept a, a fax and generally we, we get that waved under our nose very quickly uh, if it's got urgent written on it. Um, so, I mean, there are lots of different ways of, of uh, doing it. And certainly my practice, if somebody says it's urgent and I must talk to him straight away because a patient is in difficulty, um, my girls interrupt me. Um, so, yeah, I leave it to people to, to uh, work with my reception staff and they know that. Yeah, and I, I guess on the note of the, the one-page fax, I've actually found a, a handwritten fax yeah. often stands out because um, there's lots and lots of typed things come through. But if you get like three sentences on a handwritten fax, it catches your attention. Yeah, exactly. And we, sometimes you know the cursory referral may be because there's stuff that you actually don't want to have the patient seeing um, in terms of if you've actually given them the referral as well. Um, 
And if that's the case, generally I would ring the practitioner that I'm referring them to, uh, but not all of my colleagues probably do that. It's an interesting point that, um, Heather, what's, as the consumer rep, what's your sort of re feeling about um, the clinicians maybe communicating information or opinions that you don't get to see? Do you think that that's sometimes necessary or appropriate or are there any kind of guidelines around that? In all honesty, I, I would prefer that something was discussed with me or with me present. Um, I guess if it was information you know, concerning the safety of the baby or something like that, then I guess that's a different matter. And then certainly as a peer worker, you know, I've had to have conversations around both types of issues as well. But um, you know, I would say most of the time it would be nice to, to, um, to know what the concerns were. Um, I mean, I certainly can't address them if you don't know what they are. Um, I also mm -hmm. think it's really important that Karen um, Know, some sort of communications made with the GP because the chances are that Karen may go back with the baby um, in the first few few weeks. Um, young bubs seem to get sick and need vaccinations and so she's probably more likely to turn up there. It's probably um, worth just adding to that by saying that um, the, the information that I would uh, put through to the um, practitioner rather than uh, putting it all on paper, uh, Heather, I certainly would discuss with the patient. Um, it's usually things like very long uh, stories because many GPs know their patients over many, many years and know their family histories and you know, their mother's illnesses and the fact of their social circumstances and all of those sort of things. And to actually sit down and write all of that out can take an hour. And you don't necessarily have that time as a GP, whereas a five minute conversation with the other practitioner often sorts that out. Now, I certainly tell my patients that that's what I'm going to do um, rather than keep it from the patient. I, I don't believe in not sharing that information, but I let them know what can, what I can actually tell them rather than have it unsaid on the, on the uh, referral. Excellent. Thank you very much all for that one. So I think um, what I would like to do, because it, to be honest, we could talk for an hour and a half about Karen or any of the scenarios, but we're going to just try and cover them all, more of them so that we, we get the opportunity to look at a number of different issues. But before we do, I'd like to go to the poll. So um, you've got a pop up on your screen and you can vote what you would like us to talk about. So. You've got about 30 seconds to have a look at those um, topics there and then to choose your favourite. I think it's a case of vote for your favourite rather than vote early and often. So <laughs> you, you, you've got a few seconds there. So I think the poll's open and we should start to see some results coming in. Yeah, that's really good much more responsive than waiting for election results. But we don't, what's that? Anthony Green, we don't have him commentating. He just stuck with me. Yeah, but it's yeah. not nearly as complicated, so. Right, I think that's pretty much adding up to um, everybody. So we might close the poll. Thank you for that. So uh, what um, people are really interested in in particular is working with different opinions or approaches and professional hierarchies. Uh, so everyone's picked the trickiest one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then, um, then to do with risk is also something that's a high on people's priority. Uh, and then confidentiality um, and then the amount to share and then the roles and responsibilities. 
So I think if, if our panel don't mind um, just, just keeping that in mind, that they, they were the issue um, in, the, in the order there. So look at hierarchies and risk. And then I'm going to go back to the slide before with everybody's pictures. There we go. Um, now, just, just so that people know, uh, Heather's camera, Heather's uh, internet is playing up a bit. So we, we're gonna have a fixed picture of Heather, but she's still on audio. So she's very much there. It's just that she's not going to look quite so alive on the picture. Um, so I think we might go to a different kind of patient. We'll pop over and see Bill. So um, Bill has depression um, and there's a lot going on. So his wife has her own health issues, that's Angela, but she's just suddenly had to go into state to look after our grandchildren after their um, daughter was involved in a serious car accident. Now, um, you're not quite sure when Angela's coming back, when it's not quite clear whether she's gonna continue to be able to support Bill looking after his um, many health issues. And you would like to have a consultation with all of his health providers. So in this case, he has a psychologist, a rehabilitation counsellor, a dietitian and a physician. Now the rehabilitation counsellor isn't going to come unless Bill comes as well because that's a particular um, principle of theirs. But you're not quite sure if he's resilient enough to actually talk about your concerns or to hear your concerns. So I think I might actually first ask Heather to respond to that one. So um, thinking about being in Bill's position, and the, the GP seems to have a, a genuine concern for Bill's welfare and want, wants to hold this meeting to care, care for him. But um, Heather, what, what do you think about that one? Um, I think Bill's probably, okay, I think he probably has um, an idea that his wife, Angela, you know, might be in, in a position that she's struggling to care for. I don't think he'd be blind to that. So I think actually including Bill in the discussion and the concerns is really important. Plus the fact that Angela's not coming back or we don't know when Angela's coming back, he probably needs some support anyway. So um, personally, I would involve Bill and Angela in the discussion um, with the other health professionals. And I, I wonder if he'd be actually a little bit relieved to know that other people had um, been able to imagine the things that he may himself be worried about. Look, I think so too. He's probably been seen it for a while and feel, probably feels quite a bit of guilt around the fact that she's not, not managing as well and the fact that she has to look after him. So, mm. um, I think it would be really a relief for them both to sit down and have a discussion about what kind of help is out there. And back, coming back to you, Morton. So yeah. um, how, do you, how do we get all these people in the room and um, they have you know, everybody's got kind of different professional philosoph philosophies and theoretical backgrounds, um, yeah. let alone the funding model that makes it really hard to have case consultations. What That's are we going to do? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a difficult one. Um, look, the, the first thing that I would say is uh, I agree with Heather in that it would be best with Bill in the room. Um, and I'd be certainly trying to work with uh, his other counsellors outside of this meeting to make sure that he actually was resilient enough to be part of this. I would certainly have had a uh, prior discussion with him as to whether it would be, uh, whether he would like to be involved in that. And I would be upfront with him and saying, you know, it's going to be a hard conversation. and. I'm just concerned that you might find it very difficult um, and give him that option. Um, to go to the nuts and bolts though of, of setting it up, um, often uh, I would start with one or two key uh, supports for him um, and find out whether they were happy to be involved in that. Um, 
and then try and broaden it from there. It is really, really difficult to coordinate everybody together. Um, and for that number of people, you're really going to end up, I suspect, uh, eating into somebody's lunchtime or uh, or afternoon tea or something like that to get it all together. But if we are all in agreement that it is really important for this to occur for the patient's well-being, um, most people will give it a go um, and accept that it, it's worth doing. Um, certainly from a GP's perspective, uh, we wouldn't be paid for it, particularly if it was on telehealth. Um, but face to face, there are some item numbers that could be uh, could be found. Um, so, but it is about fitting it in with all your time and how how it would would function. So, I'm I'm going to name the elephant in the room. So, mm. the physician would get paid for the telehealth consultation. The GP doesn't get paid for the telehealth, but they would get paid for the face-to-face -face consultation. But Samantha, as the allied health clinician, has no item number to claim for case consultations, um, yeah. case conferences. Samantha, do you um, do you want to comment on that and, and whether that's a barrier for allied health to participate? Uh, I definitely think so. I think so, well, for myself as a psychologist, how busy I am in, in the practice. Um, I really have to would take it that after hours, sometimes even Saturday mornings or weekends. Um, it would be hard to have a case discussion like that with that many people that would do it justice over my kind of lunch hour, which could go across a couple of hours, um, in and out, in and out. So, but I, I have had this situation. I mean, there are, you know, if this was under better access or things like that, then yes, it wouldn't be funded yet, but there are some third party Schemes that do fund for that case consultation, so there there is definitely opportunities for psychology to be involved in those. And and I can think of a couple of examples where I I have tried to get everyone in the room, and some people have wanted the client, some people have not wanted the patient. So, uh, but I agree, I actually agree with everyone. Um, the resilience, I wasn't sure whether that was a physical resilience or a, or a psychological resilience. So I'd probably be talking to the GP and making sure that, you know, nothing was going to happen if he got stressed, um, considering the illnesses that, that he has and how complex it is. If I was the psychologist, I, I would be actually preparing a uh, bill for, those, for that session and, and looking at all the things that he might be worried about or that might stress him out. And I've actually had support people, so I agree with Morton, where I've, I've asked them to bring somebody so that they don't feel like there's sort of all these professionals um, sort of talking about them and, and no one to speak for them if, if they also needed that. But it, it, you know, we are fighting lots of third party funders to try and get these case conferences paid for, for everyone who's involved. Yeah, yeah. and I must I, say even, even for general practice, um, there, there is payment item numbers available, but it's still much more um, financially viable just to see four standard consultations in that hour, just yeah. your standard general practice, than to spend an hour in a complicated sort of case consultation. So even though there yeah. is some recompense, it's still not really encouraging or, or promoting this kind of practice. Yes, I get could I, one thing I was thinking to myself, you know, when Morton said, yes, look, at, it would be attractive for all of us to get in the room with a, with a patient, but also, there's, I always say to people as private practitioners, there's lots of other reasons that are good reasons to do multidisciplinary um, communication and it's not always about being paid. That, that imagine getting in a room with someone with one patient and talking to all of those people and the networks that you're forming and the, the things that you end up discussing about some other people that, that you, know, you, you may need to refer between or actually get this shared care happening. So I think there's a lot of benefits that aren't just financial that we need to consider. Yeah, I was thinking about that, but I was actually thinking from the point of view of the consumer. So I'd like to just bring Heather back in. I mean, to me, I think that there may be so much kind of gold in that meeting with everybody there that it's, it's worth um, lots of individual appointments. So just, has that been your experience or of other consumers? 
Heather. Um, I think there's a lot to be gained by having different people in the room and looking at different perspectives of things too. I mean, as the consumer goes to each person, they're just seeing one person's view rather than a holistic view of themselves. And I think it would really help, um, it would really help Bill just to be able to look at his whole life and a holistic view of what other people think and how things are going. Yeah, I certainly as a, um, a practitioner, I really value the different perspectives that different people with different kinds of training bring because they often think of things in a way that, that I just have not, not been trained to think. Um, so it, it, it is really important. Um, I think we've, well, actually I'll ask the panel, is there anything that any of you also wanted to say about Bill? before we move on to another one? Anything that you've been thinking about while, while the others have been talking? Morton, anything from you? I, I, I think the other thing to say is that you can do this um, in smaller groups. Um, you don't have to have absolutely everybody there all at once. And you may actually do it a little bit by mm -hmm. stealth. You, you have uh, a conversation with the psychologist and uh, you start the process of building Bill up. It, it's about coordination and making sure that the right jigsaw puzzles are being put together for the patient. And that's never easy. Um, and then at the end, the, to have everybody in the room is really helpful. But in our private setting, it's actually really, really hard to achieve. Uh, the times where I've seen it work well has been in the community health sector, uh, where that's a lot more easy to organise. Um, but in, if you've got everybody working in private practice, it's actually really, really difficult to get everybody in the one place at the one time. Um, it does happen easier in rural settings. Uh, it's certainly in my rural practice many years ago, uh, it was much easier to do those sort of things because people were around and you would just get everybody together at lunchtime at the hospital boardroom or something like that and bring the patient in and have that sort of conversation. It's much more difficult if people are one side of the city and the others are on the other side. Um, so we do need to be aware of logistics and sometimes just being on the phone uh, may not be as good but can be uh, helpful as well in that sort of meeting, so a, a teleconference. Thank you. I really appreciate it when people point out the benefits of rural practice. I think it's absolutely true and I've seen amazing right. multidisciplinary practices where um, the practice has been set up so that allied health can come in and they may have visiting specialists and there's meeting rooms so they can conduct groups and it can be excellent. And I even I think for recovery as well for um, for consumers, small communities are often rich places. So it's, it's really Absolutely. great to point out the benefits of rural and regional settings as well. Um, Heather, was there anything else you wanted to say about Bill's situation before we move on? Um, I was only just a little bit concerned about leaving Angela out of the picture as well because if you're making decisions about her ability to care for Bill, I kind of think she should be involved in the, in the conversation as well. Yep, good point. So we might have to, to dial her in on a teleconference or at least talk to her in advance and see what she'd like to contribute. Yep, and while you're talking about richness of rural communities, can I just add that that was my experience and I think that's why I've I've actually gain so much is having um, a multidisciplinary team of people and having those, co those cross conversations that actually help me. That's really great to hear. And Sam, anything else you wanted to um, add regarding Bill? Um, I, guess, I guess the two things I was thinking about was the poll, like the people looking at the different approaches and the hierarchies and I we sort of looked at it from well, the, the, the consumer might think it's a good idea because you get lots of heads together about the one person and there's lots of good reasons why all the professionals should do it. But if we look at 
that first slide, that shared decision making that you were talking about, we're really trying to get the client to feel empowered with all of the professionals. So really it's probably the dynamic of, of, a, of a, a patient sitting there and listening to all of the, the practitioners, their different approaches, which one they align with best, which, which way do they want to go? You know, do they think they should look at weight loss first once they've heard the dietitian talk? Or do they think actually they need to work on the psychology stuff before they go in for surgery? I think it gives them a much fuller picture of which feels right for me now I've heard all of you talk and I can see that you've got different uh, approaches and you all want me to do your approach, but um, which one would suit me at that particular time? So, yeah, I, think, I don't think I'd thought about that in that way until we looked at that case. Yeah, and that, look, there's particular models that actually focus on the value of the client being able to hear the discussions between the different disciplines. Um, there's, there's something called open dialogue, which um, has some um, a good evidence base in, in the early psychosis field and, and the interprofessional conversations, which are actually uh, witnessed and heard by the, the patient and their family are seen of that that listening in all directions is seen of particular value. So it's a really good point that you made. And Sam, I'm going to drop you in it a little bit because you're still on here. So we're going to go to another one. <laughs> and I'll let you collect yourself. So we're going to just talk about <laughs> we're going to talk about um, Tina. So you mentioned that you see adolescents in your practice. So yeah. um, Tina is a gymnast uh, and. She's taken a gap year out of uni to train as a um, competitive gymnast in the state championships. And she's, um, the GPs re referred her uh, about her anxiety. And in the course of her talking to you, she's disclosed that she's actually abusing laxatives. Now, neither the GP or her mum know about this, um, but it, she says it's the only way she can keep her mum off her back. And her mum's the trainer. So I'm wondering about the communication here. So, yeah. <laughs> where would you begin, Samantha? <laughs> um, this is actually this this is like some of my clients because um, I actually worked with gymnasts for many many years, and um, and I do do this kind of work in sports psychology. So it was a great case. I'm not sure I can answer it um, succinctly. You don't but have you don't have to do it on your own. Remember, we're um we're all here. <laughs> <laughs> um. I think this is hard because there's uh, there's quite a bit of work you probably need to do with with Tina um, to get her to the point to understand um, you know your role and duty of care and what you might consider harmful um, and what sort of agreement are we going to come to um, because I will at some stage definitely need to liaise. Um, with with people in this case, and definitely when it's got to do with you know abusing um, medication or, or pills, so I think there'd be lots of conversation about that and, and make it very clear to her if if I think there's there's harm that that um, that I may need to to make those calls and see how she feels about that. So that would be the first thing. I I think it's very common for the young people to say that, and I've had it not just with laxatives but um, all sorts of medications that they're, they're on, even if it was contraception, it could be anything, but this case that this could actually cause harm and it would alarm me what else was going on. So, um, and, I, and so just, to, just to check, I know many um, counselling professions have a, have a sort of policy of discussing confidentiality up front, particularly with young people. So, so you talk about um, what's private and, and what are the limits of that. Do, yes. Is that your practice, and do you find that that means that then these, when these tricky things come up, you've kind of got a framework already in place? Yes, yes. I mean, at the start, and particularly, I don't know exactly how old she is because she's a young adult, so she's not. I know she's not a child, so consent. She can give consent, and um, it, it's you know. So I don't have to talk to any of these people about this. But there will be a point. Um, that if she continues to do it, that, that I think it's important the GP is aware of that um, and that we have that shared care. So you would talk about it up front, you know, when they really when, at the stage of the service agreement and I definitely would do it throughout the session. Um, 
I'm often talking about a lot in this situation. I give them examples of the sorts of things I might feel that I, I might need to um, override that if it gets harmful. So I, I think I'd probably work with Tina to say, well, do you think it's an issue? And if you can show me, if you can show me that we can work on this and that you're not going to continue to overuse, um, then there'll be an agreement that we'll, we'll review. We're reviewing maybe two sessions, how it's going. Um, but at that point, we have another discussion about whether I should involve um, someone else at that point. Um, because it's very, it would be very damaging to break that confidentiality um, and you may lose that person that then could be um, dry. So it's a bit of negotiation, I think. And um, I'm, I might just ask Morton to come in here. So, so from the GP perspective, like I think sometimes when, when you make a referral to Allied Health, like I, I know I don't always remember to ask the client, what, what are you happy for us to talk about as, as healthcare professionals involved in your care? But do, is there some way in which the referral letter implies that some communication can occur? Uh, look, I always say when I refer anybody to another practitioner that I am always happy to talk to that other practitioner and if that other practitioner wants to talk to me, I will make myself available. Is that okay? And I actually do ask the patient at that time. Now, sometimes that doesn't necessarily go far enough and sometimes you have to be more specific if uh, something is particularly worrying for you. I mean, certainly this scenario is not an uncommon uh, scenario uh, in my experience. So um, it, it's the, the usual thing that I find out from psychologists and other professionals in this sort of setting is uh, a bulimia or an anorexia, which I've suspected and I've asked about, but the person wasn't ready or felt comfortable talking to me about that. And one of the reasons why I've sent them on may well be to try and tease that out. Um, so it is important for all practitioners to say, look, what are you comfortable me talking about uh, with other doctors or other professionals? Um, because to me, that sort of information is really, really important for the management of, of um, my patients. Um, and also really important for me to know what I can do in terms of therapy because you may be thinking about um, a beta blocker or uh, something else in terms of performance anxiety or something like that that might be part of this process. And if they are uh, you know, abusing laxatives or have been getting duramine down the, down the road um, or even you know, uh, an illicit uh, medication and an illicit drug. Um, that is a significant problem that if I don't know about and another health professional does and hasn't communicated that to me and something goes wrong, uh, I know from a medical legal perspective we're all in strife. Mm -hmm. So in, 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 in general, in general, uh, more more communication, and I I, I suppose I've I've thought about I mean because you I've had lots of situations arise that I just had not seen coming. You can't yeah. you just and you, you look back and you think I wish I'd said something <laughs> to set this up, but you didn't know it was going to happen. Exactly. And then I think you just have to think through carefully. And I, I've found it good practice to consult with another of my own colleagues from my own discipline to say this is the situation. What should I do? And then document that I've done that, and then just ring ring up the allied health clinician or whoever. But I I I think um, Sam's approach of of raising it with with the client and and getting their consent for communication is is 
the, the most ideal. Now, Heather, I would really like you to come in here um, as the consumer rep. Um, what have you been thinking about while we've been having this discussion? I'm actually going to put my peer work hat on because one of the things that we do as peer workers is we work with people. So we don't try and make decisions for them. And we're very much guided by their own decisions. So I guess in this instance, um, if, if I was with Tina, I would be really trying to educate Tina around the long-term effects of, of possibly using this and explaining that I may not know that without consulting with the GP. Um, mm. I'd also really highlight to her that the GP is bound by confidentiality also. And, um, you know, she, that he can't actually share anything um, with her mother um, without her consent. And so therefore, it, you know, it's a conversation between the two of them. I think the other issue too is that um, it's not just necessarily about her using the laxatives, it's about the relationship between um, her mother and herself. And, and getting to the bottom of that is going to require more communication and understanding what's underpinning, underpinning that mm. for her. Mm. And without her actually sitting down and looking at why she's doing what she's doing, um, I think is a real issue and, and not getting on top of her physical health as well. Thank you. So I might just come back to Sam uh, regarding Tina and then we'll move on to another one. Because we started with you, Sam, you probably had a few more thoughts while we've been talking. What else yes. would you like to add? Um, it was a thought that I had about, um, I, think, I think the goal, I think when, pe when, when young people come to um, particularly psychology, that, you know, it's like they think, well, here's this person that they can tell all their secrets and it'll never, you know, you don't have to talk to anyone. But I think setting it up so that they understand really clearly, like when you might have to, but it's, but everything you're doing is within their best interest. And I, and I like what Heather said. There would be, that's what I meant by I would take my time to talk to that client and educate her and hopefully help her make her own decision around what, what might be in her best interest once she knew all the information. And also, like you said before, Mary, like almost give her examples of, look, when I talk to the GP and when I talk to your mum, this is the kind of conversation we're going to have. And these are the things I learn that I don't know when I do have these conversations so that she can understand that I could help her more. Um, and But for me, psychologically, this is, a, this is the leverage point to understand probably an underlying eating disorder and the relationship with her mother. And I would make that fairly obvious. That, that we need to talk a bit more about this because we can't keep these kind of things, um, yeah, from everyone. <laughs> yeah. I think the yeah, more. I, I think the other thing to realise is that often um, everyone, uh, not just young people, sometimes are working on the wrong assumption. They don't know that. Uh, using, well, they, they may know that using laxatives gets to a point, um, but they may not know that it's bad. But the other thing is that there may in fact be very appropriate ways to manage their weight and things like that that they haven't thought about. And mm. so it's about educating them about what might be a better way of managing the situation at a physical level and as the, at a psychological level, dealing with what their issues may be with mum and the control of their coach or their team or whatever it is and how to manage that better. Um, and it may be that you don't actually need to use the laxatives or the other drugs there are other ways to do it that you just haven't heard about. Mm. Okay, thank you for that. Now I'm, I'm going to move on to um, the case of Anthony, which is a very short vignette there. I'm actually gonna change it a little bit just because the audience is interested in the hierarchy uh, and I think we, we've touched on it already, but I'm actually going to, instead of the clinician being a psychologist, I'm gonna make them a psychiatrist. So, um, you're um, a GP or, um, and 
you're making referrals to a new psychiatrist and you know psychiatrists are often thin on the ground and so you may be using telepsychiatry but in this case it's in person and then Anthony yep. comes back and he said he doesn't want to see the psychiatrist again and when you ask why he says it's because um, the, that he made inappropriate sexual remarks during the consultation. So I, I will I will start with Morton on this, but we'll be going to um, Heather and Sam as well. <laughs> so here's a tricky one. Absolutely. Um, and uh, look, uh, I, I have seen it um, uh, in, in real life to one degree. Um, I guess the, the main thing is really to talk with the patient about what it was that um, that they felt about the consultation was inappropriate or didn't work for them. Um, you know, whether it was a, a phraseology of the practitioner, uh, whether it was um, uh, an overt uh, act action that uh, that occurred that was potentially problematic uh, and perhaps, you know at the um, worst end of that spectrum would be should you as a practitioner report the other other practitioner to APRA um, and that does sometimes happen uh, or do you would there be a situation? I mean, just thinking about hierarchies. Let Let's say that that it was an allied health clinician and a GP, yep. and that the patients come back and said to their social worker, "My GP is making inappropriate sexual comments to me." Like it's mm -hmm. quite difficult as being a person lower down the hierarchy. Are you going to ring up the GP and say, "Look, this client says this. What's your version of events?" Or are you just going to report them? Well, what are you going to do? I'm not asking you to answer it. I, it's just, it's, I, how do we know what actually happened? And is it our yeah. job to find out? Um, look, I think for the individual patient, you need to work through what the, what the issues were for that individual patient. Now, if it is relatively clear that something uh, of great con of concern did really happen, um, then you do have the option of uh, asking the patient whether they want to take this further. Um, and certainly from a, and now I'm probably going to become medical legal, um, from a medical legal perspective, the report to APRA actually is taken more seriously from a patient than it is from a practitioner of the same standing um, uh, making the accusation. Um, so so I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna interrupt because I'm really interested to know what Heather is thinking here. Yeah. So from the, from the consumer and the peer worker perspective, how would you like us <laughs> to handle this, Heather? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if I was Anthony, um, I would just, be quite clear that I don't want to go back and I may not want to engage into any conversation as to why and I may not want to make a complaint. Um, I'm not sure that I'd want to be um, challenged on exactly what happened because whatever it was I've interpreted it to, to be inappropriate. Um, I think all I would want is to be offered to make a complaint if I would like to and if I choose not to make a complaint leave it at that. Yeah. That would be my perspective. And and um, Sam, oh, as an allied health yes. clinician, any comments from you? Um, I love that response, Heather, because I was sitting there actually trying to empathise with a client and thinking, what would they think? And I think that they, once they've sort of got the wrong impression about somebody and they've cut them off, they want the other practitioners to support them in just find me somebody else because I, I don't want to negotiate that. Um, and I actually think that it would be very hard to make a report to APRA if the client didn't want to talk about it anymore to, to get you know, to substantiate where that impression came from. Um, I, I, 
I would offer probably, I would offer to um, to call. I would say, would you like me to call, you know, uh, the psychiatrist to try and clear that up or to mend it somehow or to find out, you know, what they really meant if there's been a misinterpretation. I'd offer to do that. That would also help me understand how that person might react if they said yes, okay, if they felt more comfortable with that. Um, but I think if they didn't want to, like Heather said, they just want another referral for somebody else and they don't want to talk about it, then I think that makes it very hard to make a, a report um, based on that information unless you're going to check it out with the psychiatrist um, or a little bit more with the, with the patient. And look, I, I'm being deliberately a bit provocative with this because there's so much we don't know about the scenario and there's so many possibilities and um, you know, it may it may have been that it might be a psychoanalyst where it's yeah. you know com completely or or someone with an you know who considers that sexual relationships are a really important part of functioning and so they normally ask about sexual life and yeah. um, the other thing is I I think I've, I have seen situations where um, a health practitioner has made the APRA complaint based on information that their patient told them about a past incident with another health practitioner and the patient didn't want to make the complaint. Mm. Um, Morton, I know you're trying to say something. Do you want to? No, look, I, I was just going to say that as a, particularly as a GP, if you've got a longitudinal uh, relationship with your patient, you, you may actually, you know, acknowledge and say that, you know, I certainly hear where you're coming from and let's work through this and organize another referral as appropriate. But you may actually need to come back to this scenario later on in the therapeutic relationship to try and work out what it was that they felt um, was the, the problem in that relationship. Um, and that may also help the person to understand where they were at that time, perhaps, um, and some of their their beliefs and things like that. Um, so it can also be used as part of the therapy, but perhaps not right then, but you may need to look at it later. That's, that's really good advice, actually, to kind of keep, keep that in mind over time. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate Tricky, stepping into that tricky territory and I, I, I think that the audience have, have also had a pretty lively discussion in the chat box and you know it's not a simple scenario at all. Um, not at all. In fact none of them are really like life. Um, Belinda is a patient here and I'm going to ask Heather to, to start helping us think about this one. So, so Belinda's been to see a psychologist that, or an allied health clinician that the GPs referred her to and she did go four times, but it, she's just not found it helpful. So she just texted back no on the fifth appointment um, and, and didn't keep going. Then a few months later, she mentions to a friend at work about her anxiety and she tries one of the Valium and it really helps her. So she goes to the GP. I shouldn't say Valium. She just said a medication. Um, and she goes to the doctor and says, I'd like some of that. That was really helpful. And the doctor says, but I didn't. I thought you were seeing that allied health clinician. So Heather, what are your thoughts about this one? Um, yeah, I'm naughty friend. <laughs> um, I think, um, yeah, I think it. To me, it would be really important that um, you know, it was highlighted to me that using these types of medications isn't going to be helpful in the long run. And obviously, there was something that I didn't hit it off with the psychologist if I stopped going. Um, whether I thought the progress was too slow or um, I wasn't actually putting in the hard work. Um, I don't know. So I, I really probably wouldn't want the GP to um, continue to give, um, you know, to prescribe the medication. And I can understand why they'd be looking at sending you to another psychologist. Um, but then, you know, maybe it's about having a conversation with the psychologist as to what we were aiming at and what we were trying to achieve and what didn't work. And I suppose if we go back to the shared decision making idea, it's a two way exchange of information. So the GP might say, well, these are, these are the reasons I want to talk about this. And the patient might say, well, this is what I want to talk about. And then somehow you, you come to some 
kind of agreement. Yeah. But it's interesting to hear from the peer work perspective that you also would be um, supporting what sounds like the safe practice of, you know, individualised treatment and, and and not just taking taking medication recommended by friends and neighbours. <laughs> and I I know that. I know that the peer work training is, does have a really big focus on safety, um, and it sounds it sounds as though that that was the first thing you said, naughty friend. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's um, we you know we'd obviously be looking at, at what was in their best interest and trying yeah. to get them to accept that. And we're we're approaching the end of our time, so I'm going to go I think next to Sam. Um, so how was it for you? I mean, this does happen sometimes where, where patients just stop coming and you don't know why. I mean, if, if the patient's been referred to you by a GP, do you do you let the GP know or is that something that you think should happen? Yeah, I, I was thinking about, you know, probably the site doesn't really realise yet that this, this person isn't coming back to see them and you might need to wait for a period of time of trying a couple of times, um, you know, either sometimes when people cancel then then the, the, the practice manager or the office staff will just ring them back and make sure that they've offered them a rescheduling um, that that's okay if they would pick up then that something's wrong then they'd alert me and then I would probably call that person just to, and even if they wanted to close have that conversation um, and then that would help me actually then know what I'm going to say to the GP if something happens and they don't return calls which is that's what's happened three or four go past nobody returns then then probably that would be the letter that I would just send. You know, I haven't seen the person. Um, they they haven't called back. Um, I don't know if they're representing. Just wanted to let you know. Um, so that then I guess it's up to the GP when they see the client. Yeah, to discuss that. I mean, I'd go as far as to say I'd love some feedback. <laughs> didn't yes. like me. Yes, yeah. sure. So so if they go back to the GP and they say why they did why they stopped going, you you would actually appreciate hearing yeah. that yeah okay um morton i just um if you could just start responding to that one i'm just going to whip through the um the slides a little bit so so don't get dizzy sure. but if you can just respond to that one yeah thanks mary um look i i think i would hope that my colleagues didn't get uh uh thingy about uh, accusing the patient of not going to the therapist uh, because it is the patient's choice at the end of the day uh, and sometimes you do need to have a break to get your own mind in order in order to progress in therapy so um, I, I, I think that um, from the GP's perspective it's about trying to tease out whether they're still involved in uh, the therapy or whether it was something that they just didn't want to do at that stage or didn't like the approach that was being taken or you know didn't like the hours that they could see the practitioner or there are, are an innumerable number of reasons why patients don't or you know their uh, brother had Come to live with them so they couldn't get out or you know, they'd lost their car, all of those sort of aspects. So you've got to be very non judgmental as a GP uh, in that setting. Having said that, I think the other thing is then exploring with the patient why they wanted or they, they tried the medication in the first place and trying to work out um, what it was that whether it was that quick fix, if you like, that they were wanting, and then trying to talk to them about, you know, maybe there isn't a quick fix. Um, we've actually, this is what we were trying to achieve. This is how we're going to achieve it. Um, if you didn't like that particular practitioner, let's try someone else. Uh, but medication isn't always the answer, um, even though your friend says it is. <laughs> So you'd be using that sort of shared decision making approach on both both those issues. Absolutely. And, yeah. And Morton, I just we're just actually approaching the end now. So I wondered if there was just perhaps one 
one final tip that you'd like to give everyone before we leave? Look, I, I think the, the, the big tip I would say is that we are all busy, um, but we all have our patients' best interests at heart, I would hope. And as such, it is, it is over to us to communicate effectively so that the patient doesn't get lost in the cracks and we give the best patient care that we can. It does take time and it can sometimes be annoying, but we do need to communicate, otherwise the patients lose out. Thanks, Morton, that's really great. Um, now, just you will have noticed I whipped through the slides. Now, those are available to everybody in the resources. Um, so we've been sitting on the end of Samantha's slides there. So Samantha, I'd like to just bring you in. Is there any final tips that you'd like to leave the audience with tonight? Um, I, I think for me, I mean, we're, we're basically role modelling the kind of multidisciplinary care we, you know, we want to see here in this webinar. And, and listening to Heather as a consumer, um, I think has been very valuable for me and to, and to really try and look from both sides. So that's something that, that I think we can do better. And the other thing coming from what Morton just said, I think a lot of psychologists particularly, they, they, just, they think their job is taking care of the person and, and booking people back to back and back to back. But um, what I've discovered later in my career is leaving that time, leaving a bit of time for these phone calls and this, this, this kind of um, communication has actually helped me look after me better too because I think that some of these cases in our lifestyle is very hectic. And I think when you can talk, even today, doing this, I've found that very validating for me to listen to other professionals and what they struggle with. And I think you'll feel like you're more part of a team in private practice, which is really hard sometimes. Yeah. Thanks so much for that, Samantha. And just to remind everyone that the, um, the GPMHSC guidelines around collaborative practice are in the resource folder and they are really useful. Got, um, very practical things that need to be thought about. So it's a really good framework to think about this collaborative practice. And I'd like, last but definitely not least, I think it's been such a rich contribution from you as a, a consumer rep tonight, Heather. Um, what would you like to leave us with? Um, I'd just like to say that I think it's really important to have a conversation with the person and involve them in the decision making even if it's to sit down and look at a pros and cons list so that if we don't discuss something with the GP, this is the outcome we might have and if we do, this is the outcome so that the person can actually make a really good informed decision. So um, people don't always have all the facts and I think providing the facts and helping them to problem solve um, breaks down that confidentiality issue. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. It's been a really, um, I've really enjoyed it. Now I'd just like to thank also all of our participants in the, uh, uh, the audience tonight. So please make sure that you do complete the feedback survey tonight before you log out. Uh, there's a feedback survey tab at the top of the screen to open the survey. You will be issued with a certificate uh, of attendance for the webinar within four weeks and you'll also be sent a link to the online resources um, and that will include the recording of the live webinar. Remember that there are MHPN um, networks in your local area. You can join one so that you can have actual uh, in-person interdisciplinary conversations um, and we'd love you to join one. And remember that there's lots of online activities as well. That's so all there on the mhpn.org.au website. Um, and thanks so much everyone for your participation and hopefully you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Uh, good evening. Bye-bye.